Cool Science 30. This lesson is on energy demand. It's really an introduction to the last unit, Unit D in Science 30, which is on energy and the environment. So here I'm going to talk about both in Canada and globally, the production and the consumption of energy, and also kind of an introduction to various different energy sources that we do use in Canada and around the world as well. So the first couple of pictures I'm going to show you here, a couple of maps, and what I'm actually going to do is just go directly to uh, the website. So I'll just exit out of here, go to the website so we can roll around and take a look at a couple of things here. So this first one that we're taking a look at is for energy production. So the amount of energy that is produced by country We'll look at the map here and along the right hand side we can see a list of um, not obviously all of the countries in the world but a number of the different energy producers and the biggest energy producers so the numbers that they have here they are in units that are abbreviated mtoes which are million ton equivalents so this is in energy of joules and a million ton equivalents is a huge 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 number something like four times 10 to the 16 and then for china it would be that number times 2684 so we're talking big 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 numbers here so don't be concerned about the actual numbers just um how one country does compare to another so the shading that we do see on this map is representing the different consumption so the darker the color the higher the amount of consumption that there is so we can see here and probably not surprising that the most populous countries in the world do have significant energy production so that includes china which is right at the top of about the same population is india about 1.3 billion both china and india although notice that india considerably less energy production um, other countries really big on energy production united states they have a population of about 230 million. Uh, Russia, fairly big energy production as well. As you would expect, probably some of the uh, Middle Eastern countries would also kind of fit in here in terms of energy production. And uh, Canada, that we see right here as well, obviously not the most populous country in the world, but we do produce a significant amount of energy. What it does also have at the bottom here is a breakdown by different kinds of fuels that are produced by different countries and different regions around the world. So I'm not going to go sort of area by area, but what we can see is that this starts in 1990 and takes us up to 2019. What we can see is that the global energy production, it is increasing. It's not increasing at a huge rate, but it is still increasing every year and that is in most areas around the globe. So what are the kinds of energy production that we are talking about? Well, if we take a look at this pie chart here, we can see that uh, most of it, 31%, is oil. Big chunk here, coal. Big chunk here, natural gas. So realize that all three of those as well, they are fossil fuels, which are non-renewable energy sources. And we're talking about in excess of 75% of the global energy production, which is still in the form of fossil fuels. The other ones that we do have in here, electricity, of course, that can be generated through various different means, which can be fossil fuels, but it can also be renewable sources like wind and tidal and um, hydroelectric energy. And this one in here, biomass, and then a thin little sliver here for heat or what is referred to as geothermal energy. So while we're in here, I'm also going to click on this one that is now for energy consumption. So that was for energy production by country. This one is now energy consumption by country. It's still the same units that we're taking a look at here. So million ton equivalent. So how much energy is being used by different countries? So once again, as you would expect, the most populous countries would probably use the most amount of energy, and that is why China is on the top, but that's not the only factor. So United States, considerably lower population, but almost the same amount of energy consumption. Well, relatively speaking anyway, huge, huge amount of energy consumption for a country that is nowhere near as populous as China. Again, we're talking about 1.3 billion for China versus about uh, 330 million 
for you, the United States. So only about one fifth of the population, but about two thirds of the amount of energy is consumed. India, again, very populous country, comparing it to China of about the same population, uh, consuming less than one third of the energy. Canada is also in here. So Canada population less than 40 million people, but we have a significant energy consumption. And a little bit later, we'll sort of talk about what some of the reasons for that might actually be. If we take a look at Brazil, just down below, Brazil has almost the same population as the United States, almost 10 times as much as Canada. But we actually use more energy, more energy consumption in Canada than a country almost 10 times the population. So back to the presentation here. Let's uh, take a look at this one here, which shows us one of the factors anyway as to why we do have increasing global energy production and consumption over the years. And that has to do with the continuing growth of our population. So it took a long, long, long time for the human population to reach 1 billion. And that was in 1804 that it did reach 1 billion. And then it took a little more than 100 years to reach 2 billion. And then it only took about 30 years to reach 30 billion. So now what we're talking about here is exponential growth in the human population. So very, very rapid increases in the population. So uh, going up above 7 billion in 2012 and current population in 2020, when I'm doing this population, the end of 2020 is just under 8 billion people in the planet. So they have that here, 8 billion. And that seems like a pretty good prediction that in 2024, or maybe even before that, we'll reach that population number of 8 billion. So certainly that's going to be a factor as mentioned in terms of the global energy production and consumption. This one here is taking a look at per capita. And what that now means is not just overall by country or globally, but it is now really per person is what per capita is referring to. Again, it's not all of the countries in the world that are listed along the bottom here. <clears throat> And here we have tons of oil equivalents. Again, don't be too concerned about it. Other than that, well, big numbers are at the top, smaller numbers are at the bottom. And we do see here that oil producing countries are at the top in terms of per capita energy consumption. So the um, uh, countries in the Middle East, the United Arab Emirate Empire and uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, big oil producing countries and along with that because they have a huge amount of energy production they also have a huge amount of energy consumption to go along with that norway big energy producing and consuming country canada as well as we already saw and the united states so let's just kind of zoom in on our home so canada 5.1 times the world average in terms of our per person per capita energy consumption. Again, multiple different reasons for this. It's, there's not just one answer as to why this is the case and why we are consuming more energy in Canada per person than most other countries around the world. This is also kind of nice because it does try and break it down into the different energy sources. So we talk about renewable and non-renewable energy sources. So non-renewable energy sources are the four at the bottom here. And that is where we do get most of our energy from is still from non-renewable energy sources. The ones at the top, more of the renewable energy sources, one of them is strictly identified as renewable. So that would be the solar energy, geothermal, tidal energy, wind energy, all of those are renewable. But again, Canada, huge consumption globally around the world and most definitely per capita energy consumption. This is showing the same thing really only now instead of just uh, taking a look at that graph or taking a look at a map of the world here, taking a look at the colors again, the darker the color is the highest energy per person consumption. And again, the big ones that we see, of course, the North American countries, 
Here's Norway up here, Saudi Arabia. Those are some of the biggest energy use energy consumption countries globally around the world. So now focusing a little bit more um, just on Canada. So this is 2016 and we're taking a look at the trend in the energy consumption and also in the non-hydro renewable energy. So again, those would be the ones that are identified on the right hand side here, the biomass, for example, biofuels, solar, wind, possibly geothermal would also fit in here as well. So for Canada, where are we getting most of the energy from? Again, and consuming most of the energy coming from fossil fuels. So oil, gas, and coal, these are all fossil fuels that we take out of the ground and really we burn it in combustion reactions. Nuclear, about 7%, that hasn't been changing too much at all. It's been fairly steady over the last few decades and uh, nuclear energy in New Brunswick, Quebec and Ontario is where the 7% is coming from. We'll see a little bit later on that um, hydroelectric does provide a huge amount of energy in Canada, especially for some countries like Quebec, Ontario, British Columbia and Manitoba that do have um, fairly significant and large hydroelectric generating stations. Renewables, it's a fairly small percentage. It is growing as we can see at this graph on the right hand side, it's growing all the time. But still, it's a fairly small piece of the pie that we are seeing here. So um, yeah, on the right hand side, this is just focusing on the renewables and we can most definitely see that uh, wind energy, huge growth in wind energy. And that is definitely the case right here in Alberta as well. Not so much in the solar, solar panels, photovoltaic cells, not so much with the biofuels either, or you know, a little bit more with the biomass, but the big one, for renewable energy sources and the growth in Canada is in the wind industry, wind electrical power generation. Um, this one here is back to the global energy consumption, primary energy consumption. So this one is now taking a look at again, the different sources, fossil fuels, they're all still increasing. So whether it is the oil, looks like coal has maybe stabilized a little bit, oil definitely on the rise and natural gas is definitely on the rise. So certainly we're not slowing down our consumption of fossil fuels. That is growing all of the time. And we can see very, very clearly in this picture here that that makes up still the vast majority of the primary energy consumption around the globe. These are growing, but still they make up a very small segment of the total pattern that we see in terms of energy production and energy consumption. This one maybe makes it a little bit clear that um, definitely the fossil fuels, they're not really on the decrease. We're still using them at fairly significant rates. If we do take a look at the oil, we can see that, yeah, the peak sort of oil production and use does go back to the 1970s and 1980s. So yeah, it's maybe dwindling a little bit, Coal, fairly stable, not too much of a change in the amount of coal that's being used. Natural gas is sometimes considered to be a transitional fossil fuel. So not as much carbon dioxide, for example, is released through the combustion of natural gas, methane, which is CH4, compared to the coal and the oil. So we're certainly trying to decrease our use of the coal in particular, in terms of generating electrical energy transition over to gas and hopefully sometime in the future switch over to more of the renewable sources and even to the nuclear energy which does not release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere which of course is the primary gas responsible for global climate change. So back to Canada and why do we consume so much energy here in Canada per capita? Well, we are a resource-based economy and it takes a lot of energy in order to extract these resources. So whether they are the fossil fuels, the coal, the natural gas, the oil, 
it takes a lot of energy to actually extract those out of the ground and because we do have it readily available well that's one of the reasons why we do consume more energy here in Canada as well. Usually the pattern that we see as well is more technologically advanced societies. They do have the technologies that require more energy and so there's more energy consumption. But the idea behind the picture that I'm showing here is that we are a polar country, which means, well, we're close to the pole, which means we're further away from the equator and the further away you get from the equator, of course, the colder it does get. So no surprise that countries that are the more polar countries, so Russia, Northern European countries, Canada, are going to have increased energy consumption in order to keep warm in the winter time. However, you also need to realize that those countries that are close to or on the equator, they actually have the opposite problem. Whereas for us, it's cold for a large portion of the year. Along the equator, it's hot for a large portion of the year. So to deal with the cold, we need to have furnaces. We need to have heating. Along the equator, they need to have air conditioning and they need to have refrigeration. So a little bit of a, a trade-off. So in Canada, it's cold. We burn more fossil fuels and other fuels to keep warm. In the equator, well, it is warmer there, but now they need to burn fossil fuels and other energy sources in order to uh, keep cool and for refrigeration. So very, very complicated in terms of what countries around the world are consuming more fuels. Again, it's not just one thing. It's not just um, who is producing the most energy. It's not just the temperature. It's not just the amount of technology. It is those combined with probably any number of other things as well. Even within Canada, so obviously there's something wrong with this map. Uh, we have all of the provinces and all of the territories. They're in approximately the same place or where they should be, only they're not the same size. So the idea behind showing some provinces bigger than the others is it is the amount of energy consumed, again, per person by these different provinces. So we can see that Alberta and Saskatchewan, which are both energy producing provinces, they're also huge in terms of energy consumption. And a lot of that has to do with extracting the fossil fuels out of the ground, which in itself requires a huge amount of energy. Most populous country, or sorry, most populous province in the country, actually have significantly lower per capita energy consumption. And the main reason in this case really would be because they're not so much of an energy producing province, so they don't need to expend a huge amount of energy in order to extract those resources. Last couple of slides here are dealing with um, one of the equations that you do need to know about for the last unit, and that is on energy efficiency. And I'm just gonna go out here and take a look at your data booklet. So this is uh, right at the beginning of your data booklet, first page in your data booklet. And the formula that I want to talk about here is this one, which is percent efficiency, which is output divided by input times 100 to convert it into a percent. And I'll tell you right away that the big mistake that students make is they flip around output and input. They put input over output, but no, it is exactly as it says here, output energy over the input. And I just want to remind you again of these prefixes because I'm going to give you an example that uses this capital M that stands for mega, which is times 1 million or times 10 to the 6. So all of that again is directly right in your data booklet. So let's go ahead and take a look at this uh, first formula and calculation for the last unit. So energy efficiency, so here I'm just using the example of us, but it doesn't have to be us. It can be a car, putting energy into the car and then getting energy out of the car. It doesn't matter, it's a similar process. So here is the food that we are taking in. In a car, it's going to be some other kind of fuel, octane, fossil fuel that's going in. That's the energy input. So what is going out? Well, in the case of the car, it's moving the car. In the case of us, it might be moving us as well. It's some sort of work that we are actually doing. 
and that's the energy out. However, the energy out is not just the amount of work that is being performed, and that's because of the second law of thermodynamics, which says that out of the energy that you put in, the energy that comes out, some of it goes into work that is useful, but some of the energy is also lost in the form of heat. So this heat does not contribute to the useful work. It is released out of the system. So if you do think of a car, the engine gets hot, so a huge amount of the fuel that you put into the car does not go into moving the car at all. It goes into the heat that is released by the engine. And it's exactly the same with us. Out of all of this fuel that we put into our bodies, yeah, we do use a bunch of it for work, but a huge segment is also released in the form of heat. Now, because we are mammals, that's not totally useless because we do need to maintain a body temperature of about 37 degrees Celsius. But as a general rule, that heat that is released is not considered to be the useful energy. And it's not considered to be a factor that we include in terms of the efficiency. So this is the equation. It is the output over the input. The useful output, the useful output energy that we do get divided by the input energy and then times 100 to turn it into a percent. So let's just take a look at one calculation here. Make sure you're reading these very carefully to make sure you do understand that percent efficiency is equal to, I'm just going to put O here, it is the output divided by the input times 100%. Okay, so that is our equation that we're going to be using. So in other words, you need two numbers. You need a number for the output, you need a number for the input. Information up above, we have two numbers, so the big thing is which one is which. So calculate the efficiency, that's what we're trying to figure out, of a car that burns 37 megajoules. Joules, the units for energy, capital M mega. So again, that is times 10 to the 6. So 37 times 10 to the 6 joules is the amount of energy that we put into the vehicle in the form of gasoline that is being burned. In other words, this is what goes in. This is the input energy. This is the 37 megajoules. It results in 8.15 megajoules converted into motion. The motion is what you get out. This here is our output. So that's our 8.15 megajoules. So now it's just a matter of plugging those numbers in and doing your calculation. So I do want to point out here as well that in this case, we actually have the same units on the top as the bottom. So we have 8.15 megajoules at the top, and we have 37 megajoules at the bottom. So you actually don't have to plug this into your calculator. Save yourself the trouble. Because we have megajoules, the numerator and the denominator, they just cancel out. So we get rid of those units. What do we end up with? Well, we're also going to multiply this by 100%. So the number that we're going to get for our answer is going to be a percentage. So if you plug these numbers into your calculator, times it by 100, that works out to 22%. So what does that mean? Well, of all of this energy that you put into the car in the form of gasoline, you burn that fuel, Less than a quarter of it, 22%, actually goes into moving the vehicle. And that means that the remaining 78% is lost. It's lost in the form of heat.